Cindy Feldwish's mother said her daughter would always be one of the first kids to raise her hand and volunteer. And that's exactly what Ms. Feldwish did when she joined the Air Force right after high school. She was one of the first five. The first woman who became part of the Air Force Honor Guard. It was a highly prestigious role serving as the face of the Air Force to the American public and the world. Ms. Feldwish retired from the New Mexico Air National Guard in 2017 after 34 years of service. She sat down recently with correspondent Megan Kamerick to talk about breaking barriers and her dedication to service. Cindy Feldwish, thank you for joining us on New Mexico in Focus. Thank you, Megan, for having me here today. You entered the Air Force right out of high school. Why were you attracted to it? Well, it was really interesting. I was always the child that would volunteer, and so when I got a direct mail piece from the Army with three stickers on it, three red star stickers of where in the world do you like to go? Well, I love stickers. So I just did the stickers and <laughs> put it in the mail and the army called and my mom and dad about had a fit and I was just laughing so hard I couldn't even see straight and six months later I was in the Air Force. Okay, <laughs> that, was, that was a very impromptu decision. <laughs> that was in 1975 and then the following year they had a new training program that began to incorporate women into the Air Force Honor Guard. So you and four women were the first to become f the female members of the Honor Guard. What was it about the Honor Guard that attracted you that you wanted to be part of that? Well, I was in tech school in 1975 um, in Colorado at Lowry Air Force Base, which is no longer in existence. And these men were in the dining facility and they had black uniforms on. And I went up and I'm just Miss Curious. That I, I should have never volunteered and I volunteered for everything. I broke the number one cardinal rule. So I said, sir, <laughs> I said, what do you do? And he said, oh, we're, lo we're looking for recruits into the honor guard. So. I went through the whole process and I was selected and then we went through training in um, 1976 and we started out with nine women and five of us made it through. Why is it so prestigious? Oh, because the mission of the um, Air Force Honor Guard and at that time it was called the Air Force Presidential Honor Guard and it's a special duty. So only the top enlisted people get to serve in the unit. You have to have a presidential security clearance. You have to be physically fit. You have to have an attitude that you are there. And the mission of the Honor Guard is to represent airmen to the American public and the world at any ceremony from funerals to arrivals and departures at Arlington or Andrews Air Force Base when the dignitaries come in. Arrivals and departures of? Dignitaries of the okay. president, of the vice president, of foreign officers that come in, foreign governments. It's very, very, um, it's high visibility. We are the face of the military for the Air Force and every other branch of service also has an honor guard. But was so special is the Air Force was the first branch to allow enlisted women to serve in the ceremonial guard. Um, what kind of training did you have to go through? Um, now I'm into basic training number two out of three in my career. Oh, you, had to do, oh, you had to do another basic training. Oh yeah, six weeks and um, everything we had it was in one building. So they put us upstairs on the third floor and they secured off a few rooms and it was very, very intense because they, they had to teach us drill and ceremony and then attention to detail. So, <laughs> I mean, the inspections, I mean, we were shaking in our boots. I mean, that's all you did was prep, 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 prep. You had sheets on the floor so that you wouldn't mess up the wax job because you had to use these huge buffers to do that. If your bed wasn't made right, the mattress <laughs> went out the third floor. So then you had to haul your mattress back up and remake your bed, they'd pull apart the um, drain pipes to see if there was hair in the drain and if your oh drain goodness. pipes were. And you all had long hair, I saw your photos. Oh, <laughs> yes, we had long hair and your uniforms in the closet had to be precise amount of inches away. And it was just the attention to detail that you would always, always represent your country in the best way possible as a ceremonial guardsman. Doing that kind of training during the summer in Washington, D.C. must have been challenging. I mean, you, not all the women made it through the training. That must have been physically difficult. I think you're just so young and you just want to get through the day. You don't really um, understand it. But there's some parts that were just like, 
just so funny and I would just get in trouble like you wouldn't believe. So we're out there practicing with the casket and it was empty because um, one of our main functions is military funerals at Arlington. So I laid on top of the casket for weight. Oh my gosh, those sergeants come running across the field and oh. So needless to say, I never did that again. Well, that, you weren't supposed to do that? No, because I simulated weight so oh, we well, could well. understand yeah. the body bear team and they didn't think that, they didn't appreciate that sense of humor. But <laughs> you know, there's just priceless moments like that and I was never treated with more respect up and down the chain in that entire building by every person in the honor guard from officer to enlisted. They embraced us. You did this for four years, about four years? No, no, um, just some roughly two years. Okay. And, um, and there was no I am special regulation, you know, like we're girls and um, my captain brought me into his office and the reporters were there and he said, Airman Feldwish, you are not special. He goes, you are here to serve as a ceremonial guardsman. And you just go, yes, sir. And you move smartly on and you always followed orders. And, um, but there was some publicity on us. And the only thing um, the guys did that was really funny, and it was more of an initiation and it wasn't harassment, it wasn't mean spirited. But since we all lived in the same building, if you didn't get to the laundry room fast enough, the next day going to uh, an event, it mm -hmm. could have been a funeral or an arrival departure or whatever it was at Andrews Air Force Base. They would announce which color underwear went up the base flagpole. <laughs> so you, you know, better go down and get your laundry fast. Oh, yeah, or it'd be hanging on the pipes in the laundry room. And, but it was never in a mean-spirited way. It was more like, you're one of us and you better get used to it. So there's priceless funny moments like that, but we were always treated with respect. What kind of challenges did you first, the first five women, the first five face in um, being the first one? One, they, they wanted to see whether or not we could make it through training, which was amazing. Um, and two, we did. Um, the bond that the five of us had was um, amazing. And to this day, um, four of us reunited when we were um, recognized for 40 years of serving after the fact. And we only cannot find one of um, our friends, Terry Hale Brown. And to see so many women that have gone beyond us to become commanders and the first woman on the drill team, et cetera, et cetera, it just makes you look back with pride knowing that you broke those barriers. I know that initially you trained really intensely with M1 rifles um, and then you weren't allowed to carry them because there's a ban on women in combat. So your uh, commander, Captain Mayer, had to lobby to get this changed. You also weren't allowed to participate in White House ceremonies. No, at that time we weren't. That was the only ceremony we were banned from because at that time, to, for many foreign governments, to see a woman representing the military with a weapon was offensive. How did you get that changed? Um, I don't know which one of the, um, my um, friends wrote the letter, but we all signed it to Rosalind Carter and um, asked her if we could have equal rights to serve and represent the military. So when we look back, it's like, wow, we all signed that letter and we did this. And um, it was um, an incredible time. And then the other thing, um, there was many firsts and like, the woman that I shared a bathroom with, the Jack and Jill bathroom, she was the first woman, Margie Jones, to work in the armory to issue out the weapons. And I was the first woman to um, represent the Honor Guard and be a Pentagon tour guide, which was another special duty assignment that the Honor Guard also does. So there was, we kept, even though we were ceremonial guardsmen, we still reached out and did more and more and more in the unit. Did it feel at the time like this was this monumental change because you were the first and your colleagues were the first? No. <laughs> I, I mean, you just wanted to get through the day. You wanted to graduate. I mean, you, you, your time was spent so much on polishing your shoes, getting your uniform ready. And um, so like when you ask what a typical day is like, you were 
always had to be on call. You always had to be ready. And even after our six week basic training and they moved us down to the first floor. And it's really interesting because I had saved so much documentation. I have the original key to the building where the four, our four rooms were. And since Terry was married, she shared a room with Liz. And they go, how did you think to save that? And um, you know, you, you just don't know, but I just saw the importance of documentation early on and that's why I have this today. And um, it's just so important to own your career and what you've done. Um, what was uh, the proudest moment during your time in the Honor Guard? Oh, probably the first time I got to wear my ceremonial uniform because they didn't have uniforms for women. And so I was so excited. I called my parents in Cincinnati. I said, I said, Mom, we're coming. All the ladies are coming and Lieutenant Colonel Spriggs is coming with us. And at that time he was a lieutenant. He retired as a lieutenant colonel. And because we had to have our um, custom uniforms made. So I was so... And they had to do it in Cincinnati? <laughs> uh-huh, yeah, that were, they found the tailor. Oh. And um, so I think probably the first time I got to wear the, the uniform and put it on and, and um, do a ceremony with um, the men in the unit. There's, I think I fell in love with the Air Force then and the protocol and the pomp and circumstance and the pride you have wearing a uniform. So it didn't matter if I was in my fatigues or in my ceremonial, I was proud, always proud to wear the uniform. I know that uh, after you finished your stint in the Air Force, you went and got a bachelor's degree, you were in the reserves, but, and then you enlisted with the Colorado Air National Guard and became an officer. But then your employer moved you around, um, you were in Denver, Kansas City, St. Louis, what did you do in civilian life and like how did you balance that with being with the guard and in the reserve? Um, well, I, um, I was in consumer product sales with major companies and so they moved me from, oh my gosh, from Denver to Kansas City to St. Louis. And so I would change units from the guard to the reserves. And not every civilian employer understands or appreciates the laws. And so when I got selected to go to officer training school, I asked my national sales manager if I could go. Well, my regional sales manager said no. And so I had to, yes, or he was gonna fire me. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And there's this incredible organization called the Employer Support of the Guard, of the Reserve and the Guard. And so they're the ones that helped me through a lawyer to secure my civilian jobs so I could go to six week to officer training school. So there's always challenges. Nobody said life would be fair. You know, you just have to, and I think the beautiful thing I learned in the Air Force is you just adapt and overcome. And so I got through that and then it's, it's been a struggle to maintain uh, my military career. And so in the, my last consumer products company, when it was my third downsizing, my supervisor wrote me up for being in the reserves and held it against me. And I was that was illegal. Oh yeah. And so then HR flies down from Racine, Wisconsin, and they pull me in this hotel room and they wanted me to sign on the line. And I'm like, no, won't do it. So my lawyer um, saved me in St. Louis, uh, Mr. Steve Cox, he saved me. And we worked out a deal so that they could not hold it against me for being in their military. So then I thought, okay, Cindy, you've been through three corporate downsizings. And then I looked around and I thought, well, the military is not gonna go out of business. And so then I went um, and started backfilling active duty around the world. And once again, like within the Honor Guard, I volunteered for every assignment I could. I know you went a lot of places. You uh, volunteered as a UN peacekeeper in Haiti. Oh. And you also did public affairs during the Iraq War. Why, why did you want to volunteer for these? Um, well, I just personally believe that if you're not willing to put your life on the line for this country um, and you have the chance to by volunteering, 
I didn't want to end my career knowing that I didn't risk everything for this beautiful country because we certainly have won the lottery being Americans. And so um, I always, no matter where I went, I always had like two missions. I had the military mission and then I always had these special missions. It's like, okay, I get it. So in Iraq, I worked with um, the State Department people and there was such a problem at the hospital because when the injured would come in, they'd cut off their uniforms and then ship them out, but they didn't have any clothes. So the UN, um, so across the hall, the State Department ladies had extra care packages, the chaplains had extra care packages. So I organized everybody for a heart-to-heart -heart program and we got all of these extra clothes and blankets from care packages and got them to the hospital. And not only for the troops flying out, but also for the third country nationals. So there was always, um, an extra mission that I always found to do. One of your colleagues called you a rock flipper. Oh. What do you mean by that? Oh my gosh, it was this one man um, I dated once and he goes, Cindy, you are nothing but a rock flipper. And I said, what's a <laughs> rock flipper? He goes, you'll flip over a rock just to see what's underneath. And that's just a good way to describe my career because um, ships are safe in harbors, but that's not what they're built for. So I always wanted to see the world I always wanted to, um, I never lived in fear. And, um, and I think after Iraq, when you know you would wake up alive, you'd go, okay, it's a good day. And it just, that perspective changed everything. And to see when somebody, and I saw somebody die in Iraq and I just hugged the doctor and he's crying and I'm crying and um, that, that will never leave you of what people sacrifice so that we can live in freedom here. I just, and how ha people have to live in Haiti with just absolutely nothing and they put dirt in their pancakes to try to stretch a pancake out. Or I, hold, I saw a woman going down the street holding her breast that was just riddled with cancer because there is no health care. That just never leaves you. Or the voodoo ceremonies going down the street. I mean, if that doesn't like, or they're selling voodoo statues outside your hotel, or one day you wake up and your room is covered in water because of this huge storm that went through and there's electrical wires everywhere and you weren't killed. It's like, hmm. <laughs> or, um, you know, just like the amazing things are rats this big outside the hotel room and you're just, but you just make do. And it was interesting because we always had to carry a nine millimeter, but yet, the Air Force never considered it a combat zone. Mm -hmm. And the foreign countries we worked with were incredible. And so just to have that team building with foreign nations, and even to this day, I still keep in touch with people around the world.